Jewish and has always been a part of my Jewish life. Uh, my mother is from an Ashkenazi, Yiddish-speaking, Jewish socialist, Litvak background. My father's family were Syrian Orthodox Jews in Brooklyn. My mother was in Michigan in the Midwest. Um, and so I've always had a sense of Jewish and in terms of internal Jewish diversity in my sense of identity and self and practice and belief and culture. Now, this program is not specifically focused on subsets of the Jewish community in that sense, but I do want to start with a declaration that it is long past time to get rid of an old phrase. And that phrase is looking Jewish. You don't look Jewish. That person doesn't look Jewish. What does that mean? I mean, we think of someone like this as looking Jewish, but someone like this also looks Jewish, perhaps from a Mizrahi or a Maghrebi from North African background. These Ethiopian Jews from Israel look Jewish in a modern sense. Now, I tried Googling a Tel Avivnik. That was sort of tough to find, but I think a person on the phone while driving is probably a good approximation. This intellectual thinker is an Orthodox Jew. He goes by the pen name Manish Tana. He looks Jewish to me. And I'll give you one guess which of the three people on this campaign poster is not a Russian Jew. Okay. So we understand that looking Jewish was never really that simple. That was a very Ashkenormative, Ashkenazi-focused approach anyways. But especially today, when you add conversion, adoption, intermarriage, and the children of intermarriage, the whole concept of looking Jewish is very 20th century. And I'll add just one more image here. Some of you may recognize this woman. She is actually both a rabbi and a cantor by training. She is the rabbi of one of the largest reform synagogues in North America, in New York City. Her name is Angela Bookdahl. Uh, my understanding is that her father was born Jewish, her mother was born Korean. She herself went through a conversion experience as well. But imagine what her congregation thinks if someone says someone looks Jewish or doesn't look Jewish, because what does the rabbi look like? <laughs> so let's try to work that out of our vocabulary, the concept of looking Jewish. Now, if we really want to explore the idea of being Jewish and, we have to start with what we mean by being Jewish. Now, there are many ways to define this and break this down. I don't have the time in one or 30 Limud sessions to fully do it justice. But if we break it into some major categories, you can think of first being Jewish as a religious identity. Uh, religion includes beliefs about the universe, about humanity, revelation, and so on. It can include ritual practices, it can include specific liturgy, prayers, blessings, other recitations. In many religions, you have dietary laws and other personal behavior laws that are part of the religious belief and life system. And of course, most religions have holy days or holidays, life cycle celebrations, and other major moments in the calendar. So being Jewish could be a religious identity. For some, being Jewish is an ancestry identity. It's almost a kind of biology, whether it's the maternal mitochondrial DNA studies, or the paternal Cohen gene DNA studies. Um, it can be a kind of family tree biological descent. I mean, after all, with Ancestry.com and 23andMe and all these other uh, family tree and genetic explorations, for some people being Jewish is a question of their biography and biological heritage. For other people, it's a more nebulous concept of heritage, not strictly biology, but more what they've inherited, their culture. It can include languages, Jewish food, Jewish art, Jewish clothing, material culture, Jewish music, and maybe for some people, holidays and life cycle fit more comfortably into a cultural understanding than a strict religious understanding. And then a concept that's very popular today is the idea of peoplehood. And peoplehood really is much more of a kind of claim of shared identity. It's much harder to put your finger on it, and sometimes it's almost an invented concept. You know, when Italy was first formed as a united kingdom in the middle of the 19th century, only something like 15% of Italians spoke standard Italian. And there were vast differences between French people in the south of France and Provence and in the north of France and Brittany, and yet they claimed to be part of the French nation. Even in the United States, we talk about the American people 
which is a tremendous diversity, but also has a claim of peoplehood behind it. And we use the phrase periodically, sort of tongue in cheek, that someone's a member of the tribe. That's a claim of Jewish peoplehood too. Now, these different categories are not mutually exclusive. Different people can connect to one or two or three or all of these, and they can have different priorities or different degrees for different people in different communities. And being Jewish doesn't fit neatly into just one of these. Jewish has never been only a religion. Its origins are as a national identity and culture. Um, it's an identity conveyed by birth, which is not purely a belief-based religion. Um, and the conversion inquires, uh, involves acquiring a new pedigree. You become a Ben, uh, Sarah, uh, ben Avraham or Bat Sarah, you, you get a new ancestry almost. You're adopted into the family. And Judaism is also not simply an ethnic group, both because of the visual and cultural diversity that we've seen. You know, if ethnic group includes language and food and appearance, well, that's something that's broader than uh, a simple category for Jews. And you joined the group by a religious conversion. Well, how can you convert to an ethnic identity? But you can join a religious identity or maybe join a peoplehood. Also, to be honest, many Jews today do not believe or follow the ritual practices that Jewish tradition tells them to do. Many of them don't recite the prayers and blessings they're supposed to say daily. So it's not a surprise that in 2013, when uh, the American Jewish Survey Organization, the Pew Forum, investigated how people identify as Jewish, we found a large proportion of American Jews identify being Jewish mainly as a matter of ancestry or culture, or sometimes a kind of cholent of all of the above, a stew that mixes together religion and ancestry and culture. But those who said it's only a religion or primarily a matter of religion, that was a very small minority, only 15%. Even among those Jews who said that they were Jewish by religion, that they said their religion is Jewish, over half said being Jewish is mainly a matter of ancestry and culture or a combination of all of the above. So the reality is that being Jewish is a complicated mix of many factors. Now for a minority of Jews, being Jewish is an all-consuming identity. It defines their religious belief and practice. It defines their shared ancestry. It defines their choice of marriage partners. It defines also their leisure reading, their music, their cultural expression, what language they speak, their politics. It limits their exposure to the surrounding culture and so on. Now I say that that is part of the Jewish community, but it's a minority of Jews. For most of us to differing degrees, we're living in the diverse world of Jewish and. So I'll give you some examples. You can be Jewish and your particular gender identity. That makes a difference to be Jewish and a man or Jewish and a woman or Jewish and non-binary or any of the other options that are available today. Your sexual orientation also makes a difference. That's the LGB part of LGBTQ+. Um, your socially accepted race or color, which I know is a very loaded discussion. And if we want to, we can dive into that a bit later. Um, and we'll talk more about that. Your age, what generation you feel a part of can affect your flavor of being Jewish and what language you speak is your primary language at home or abroad. Did you attend university? And if so, which one? Which sports team are you a large fan of? Uh, what country do you live in? What country is your citizenship? Where were you raised as opposed to where you're living now? And what's your political affiliation? What flavor of, uh, uh, of political engagement is part of who you are? You can be Jewish and all of these categories. So let me give you my answers to these just to show you one version of this. I'm male and I'm cisgender, which means I've always been male and that's who I am today. Um, I'm straight, I'm married, I have two kids, that defines my sexual orientation. And again, being Jewish with children is a different experience than being Jewish and without children or Jewish and unmarried. Um, I define myself as white um, in part because I'm defined by society as white, whether it is in relation to uh, talking to a police officer or when I go to the beach and I decide whether or not to apply sunscreen. In that case, I'm definitely very white. I'm 45 years old, I'm part of Generation X. Uh, my primary language is English, although I've learned others in the course of my life. I attended Yale University and the University of Michigan, so I have allegiances to those entities. Um, I root for sports teams from Detroit, Michigan, which is where I was born and raised, even though I'm living in Chicago now, so my children have the odd experience of 
having two sets of fandoms, their native raised one in Chicago and their inherited one from Detroit. I'm a citizen of the United States and generally I am in the democratic camp. Now, being Jewish and these categories is generally not that controversial because they're sort of different categories of thought. You know, you're Jewish by religion and politically conservative or progressive. You're Jewish by heritage and a New York Yankees fan by interest. You're Jewish ancestrally and a political citizen of Australia. Uh, now, some might not like certain combinations of Jewish and details in this. For example, look, witness the arguments between Jewish conservatives and Jewish progressives over who is a bad Jew or who is collaborating with the enemy. They both accuse the other of being the wrong kind of Jewish and. But most of us, particularly in a Limud pluralistic context, understand that there can be many variations on this kind of Jewish and as additions to a base identity, Jewish plus sports fandom or political preference. Now, language and national identity is not just an elective. Those are more deeply rooted, and no offense to sports fans. Um, and gender identity, sexual orientation, race are even more so deeply rooted. But most of us today accept that being a queer Jew or a Jew of color means that you're both of these identities. And you can draw creative inspiration from the intersection of these identities. Think of the uh, pride flag, which combines a Jewish star with the uh, rainbow flag. Again, some might not accept these combinations as legitimate, but those who don't accept these are the global Jewish minority. My key point here is that Jewish and can exist within an individual person. In my own example, I identify as both a Jew and as a humanist. I'm Jewish by culture and by ancestry and by peoplehood and by religious heritage. And I'm a humanist by my personal beliefs and values. And my Jewishness also affects those things too. I don't see a contradiction between those two. I see a fruitful interaction with my identities as both a Jew and as a humanist. I have in common with non-Jewish humanists how I understand the world through science and human experience. I share with them an emphasis on the power of people to improve the world or to destroy it, and also our responsibility to do our best by each other and by the planet. And I share with them the need to meet human needs as a basis for morality. Now, I have in common with other Jews who share my religious heritage, a long and evolving culture with holidays and life cycle celebrations, philosophy, debate, and uh, literature, both sides of my and, the Jewish and humanist, inform each other, and they connect me to people and ideas beyond myself. And we know today that many Jews, and many more tomorrow, will have one Jewish parent and one parent of another heritage. That's the next step to consider on the question of Jewish and. Can you be Jewish and in the same category and not in different ones? Can you be or claim membership in two ethnicities? Can you be Jewish and Jamaican, Jewish and Chinese, Jewish and Italian? Can you claim two religions? There are plenty of Jewish Buddhists out there and there have been for a long time. And there are plenty of Jews who are secular Jews and define themselves that way and have been so for a long time. But can you be Jewish and Christian? Or is that a never the twain shall we mutual exclusion? What about being part of two peoplehoods? Can you be Jewish and indigenous? Can you be Jewish and part of the American people? Or, you know, in the old debate, maybe 30 years ago, you'd have in youth group retreats, um, if Israel and America got in a war, which side would you fight for? Um, I don't know if that happens in Australia either, but uh, that was the old battle of you'd have to pick one peoplehood as primary over the other. Um, or can you participate in both in some way? Now, when it comes to biology or ancestry, that's perhaps a little less controversial to claim being both because it's like a family tree and it's not controversial to claim that you have one side of the family that comes from this place and one side of the family that comes from that place. That's a description of reality. It can be backed up with a DNA test or simply by uh, family records. Now, some would say that you can't be both in the same category. You could be ethnically Jewish, and philosophically secular, those are different categories, but in the old Yiddish phrase, one tuchus can't dance at two weddings. 
You can't claim two ethnicities. You can't claim two religions. You could root for the New York Yankees in baseball and the Chicago Bulls in basketball, but you cannot root for both the New York Yankees and the New York Mets. That's not allowed. There, I'm sure there are better Australian sports equivalents, but you can fill in those yourselves. So two concepts I want to consider here as parallel discussions. The first one is the idea of being beyond the binary. This is part of the discussions that go on in the uh, transgender community. The thought is that gender is an either or, it's either male or female. And for many people, Jewishness is an either or. You either are Jewish or you are not Jewish. Um, I've sometimes heard the joke, uh, being half Jewish is like being half pregnant. Either you're in or you're out, one way or the other, and that's it. There are actually people who I sometimes jokingly, but only somewhat jokingly, call ethnic bouncers or cultural bouncers, religious bouncers, who you show up at a Hillel at a campus or you show up at a Shabbat service and you have blonde hair or you have darker skin and they start interrogating you in terms of your background. And if they find out it was your father who was Jewish and not your mother, then they say, well, you're not really Jewish because they've now uh, planted the flag and defended the doors of this community because it's either or, in or out. Now, the reality is for most people, Jewishness is somewhat more of a spectrum. To give you another piece of evidence, think of Adam Sandler's Hanukkah song. He talks about people who are half Jewish and a quarter Jewish, and we know exactly what he means. In fact, we're much more permissive of celebrities being included on a spectrum of Jewishness than we are of ordinary lay people who try to join our communities. So if we think of degrees of Jewishness beyond the binary of in or out as a spectrum, that changes between people and even within one person at different moments in their life. And no one of Jewish heritage is either zero or 100%, we're all somewhere in the middle. Then that I think is a much more productive conversation. The second concept to understand is the idea of religious heritage as distinct from a strict religious tradition with strict rules that must be followed with fixed beliefs and practices. Now, why do Jews light Hanukkah candles? Some light the candles as a memory of a miracle of oil lasting for eight days, which is a story that shows up in the Talmud, but not in the original Maccabee books or in Josephus or in earlier sources. But many Jews may not believe literally that the oil lasted for eight days and they light the Hanukkah candles because it's a family tradition or because it's popular in the season. And in the Northern hemisphere, at least it's dark at night in the winter in the time that we light Hanukkah candles and it has a kind of compensatory psychological effect on it. And so maybe you light the candles Loosely in keeping with tradition, you have the eight candles in a row with the shaman set aside a little bit differently following the rules, but you do it in a little more creative way. And maybe for some, they still light the candles, but they do so in a way that's all over the map. that looks almost nothing like the traditional menorah, but it still carries on their family tradition of lighting lights in that season. There are plenty of non-Jews, by the way, who celebrate a holiday called Xmas. They also call it Christmas, but it's really much more about opening gifts and singing carols and eating certain foods and having a tree. And they never set up a nativity scene and they never go to midnight mass and religious services. The reality is that a lot of families that we call interfaith families are living more in the world of religious heritage and they're much more aptly described as intercultural families of different religious backgrounds. It's less common to find a, a combination between a church-going Christian and a synagogue regular Jew. We'll see more about that in a bit. Now, this is why we have to talk about these concepts, because intermarriage is really the new step forward in the question of Jewish and, because you have families who may feel connected to more than one religious tradition, and thus they might raise children who might feel co connected to more than one religious tradition. And here's where Jewish and has the real possibility of keeping doors open for them. Now in the humanistic Jewish movement, we've served intermarried families and their children for over 50 years. We've officiated at their weddings, we've welcomed their children and educated them, we affirmed their family choices. Uh, we did so because we believe it's their human right to marry the person they love, it's a basic human right. And the reality is that they're gonna get married whether or not we show up at the ceremony. We're not going to stop them from getting married by saying no. Our choice is rejection of them or a kind of reluctant foot dragging, or we can celebrate that they found love and now we can provide the home for them to explore the Jewish part of this new family in a non-exclusive way, the chance to be Jewish and. 
if the person getting married or the child of intermarriage is told, you have to choose between the person you love and the parent you love and our Judaism, you have to pick one, well, we will lose far too often. If instead they are told, how wonderful that you love your partner, your parent, your extended family, now I invite you to come and study this part of who you are. How much better results can we see? So I wanna share some data from American Jewish experiences with this. Most of this comes from the Pew study, again, from 2013. I'm very excited to see the Pew 2020 study, which I understand they're working on right now. You can see that before 1970, the vast majority of marriages involving Jews were to other Jews, only about 17% uh, were married to a spouse who was not Jewish. You can see that number changes a bit in the 1970s, uh, up to two thirds marrying Jews and one third not. And then by the 1990s, that has flipped into the 50% range and even over 50% range. Now, the result of these surveys coming out of the 1990s showing this 50% rate was mass Jewish organizational hysteria with emphasis on in marriage and Jewish education and Jewish camping and railing against the Holocaust of intermarriage and the disaster of intermarriage and how terrible is intermarriage. And you can see the results by 2013 has been no impact on, on the rate of intermarriage. It still happens because intermarriage happens in an open society where you go to university and you meet wonderful people who happen to not be Jewish and you fall in love. That happens and it happens all the time. Now, the result of this, by the way, after 20 plus years of a 50% intermarriage rate, is that on college campuses today, you will have more college students with one Jewish parent than you will kids with two Jewish parents. There are twice as, married, as many intermarried families as there are in married. Think of the math. If you had 100 Jews and they marry a Jew, that makes 50 Jewish households, right? It's like they marry each other. But if you have 100 Jews and they marry 100 not Jewish people, then you have 100 households that have one Jewish partner and 50 households that have two Jewish partners. And think of the possibilities in that larger population body that you lose by insisting on the two Jewish parents approach or by assuming that every Jewish household has to be a two Jewish parent household. And we can see some of the results of this in recent generations because you see the percent of Jewish adults with one versus two Jewish parents. In the silent generation, that's World War II more or less, only 6% of Jewish adults today had only one Jewish parent. Uh, the number is a little bit larger for baby boomers, but you see the explosion Generation X and especially among millennials. Now it's even, 48% each have one Jewish parent or two Jewish parents. Now there are three big reasons why that was not the case in earlier generations, in the silent and baby boomer generation. Why did those kids not identify as Jewish? Well, first, it was nearly impossible to find a rabbi who would marry their parents. Uh, I worked with two rabbis in my career who were willing to do that in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and they did literally thousands of weddings, over 3,500 weddings for one of them in his rabbinic career because he was one of the only ones willing to do weddings for one Jewish partner and one not Jewish partner. The second reason why the kids were less likely to identify as Jewish is that the Jewish community would reject them and would reject their families. Uh, they wouldn't allow them to join and they wouldn't recognize their kids. Now, the third reason is related to that. Before the uh, latest generation, Jewish men were much more likely to marry a non-Jewish partner than Jewish women were. And they knew that they wouldn't be accepted by most Jewish communities if they had a non-Jewish mother for their children. Remember, the reform movement's patrilineal descent decision was only in 1983, so that's affecting Gen X and millennials, but the earlier generations were not affected by that. So if you couldn't have a rabbi do your wedding, and you couldn't find a community that would accept you as a member, and your kids wouldn't be recognized anyways because their mother wasn't Jewish, what are the odds the kids are going to claim a Jewishness that they've been told over and over again they're not entitled to? In fact, the fact that a higher proportion of adults today have one Jewish parent means we're doing a better job at retention. And you can see that data as well. If you look at the older generations, those 65 and plus with one Jewish parent, 75% of them don't identify as Jewish because they were told get lost. But in the younger cohort, 59% identify either as Jewish by religion or as a cultural or uh, ancestral Jew. Um, and only 41% say that they're not Jewish. And one hopes those numbers will improve in the next round of studies but you can see that trajectory that we're doing a better job of retaining by being more open. 
You can also see the results when you ask parents how they're raising their kids. In the 1990s, you see that 25% are raising them exposed to both in some way. That could just be, by the way, home Christmas, home Hanukkah. It doesn't mean they're going to church and synagogue necessarily. Only 18% were being raised as Jewish only, and 57% were being raised not Jewish, either not religious or as Christian only. Fast forward to 2013, we have more positive numbers. So Jewish by religion is about the same, 20% doing Jewish and about the same, 25%. Cultural Jewish now shows up as 16%, or mix means they have multiple kids being raised differently in a household. Think of a blended household. Um, but the not Jewish number has gone down from 57% to 37%. Is it perfect? No. But remember, you have twice as many intermarried households, so it can be a net Jewish positive if you get even half of them to have the kids identify as Jewish in some way certainly compared to what was before in the 70s and 80s. Also, the gender balance has improved on the intermarriage rate where it's more or less equally likely that a Jewish woman or Jewish man is going to be the Jewish partner intermarrying. We have more welcoming communities. And I am doing far fewer weddings than my predecessors did. Instead of 100 or 200 a year, I'm doing 25 a year. And there are more rabbis out there willing to do these weddings, which means more likely opportunity for the children to identify that. And the other point I want to emphasize is that the people that Jews who intermarry marry are not as religious as they used to be either. So there was a study done in 2019 by Brandeis University focused on people who had applied to the Birthright Israel program. And they asked them questions and also asked if they were intermarried, their non-Jewish partners questions as well. So one example is the data I have here. When they asked the current religious identity of non-Jewish partners, over half, 56% said they are not religious at all. Another 6% said they're what we call today Jewish adjacent, either informally Jewish, partially Jewish, or in the process of converting. So only a third identified as Christian, whatever that means to them. And again, a large number say they're not religious at all. Um, and this is reflected in uh, ritual observance. So they asked, what things did you do that could be called Christian observance? And they didn't ask them to clarify what they meant by Christmas or Easter. But you can tell by the numbers here, 86% of these families celebrated a uh, Christmas of some kind, most likely a tree in the home, and about 50% did an Easter of some kind, which could have just been, you know, bunnies and baskets. But 90% of them never attended Christian religious services. So these are much more intercultural families than interfaith families. And if you ask them, what do you mean by Christmas? Well, is Christmas religious? A lot of them say, well, not really, not at all or a little. Um, is Christmas a time for family traditions? Large numbers of them say, yes, it's really about family traditions. By the way, Jews say similar things about Passover too. Um, is Passover more about family traditions or more about religions? Well, there's more of a consensus that it's religious than Christmas is, ironically, um, but there's still a large favoring of the family traditions uh, over the religious options. So what do we do with this information? If you can celebrate Christmas and Hanukkah as a religious heritage and not as mutually contradictory, then maybe that works. Maybe those people who have been raising them Jewish and Christian in some way, the 25% in both studies, maybe there is a way to do both religiously. But the reality is that these families are going to make their own choices, just like getting married, they're gonna make their own choices for what happens in the home as well. So maybe the solution in terms of thinking of being Jewish and Jewish and is to think about Jewishness as a family identity. You can be connected to more than one family at a time. I'm part of my wife's family, she's part of my family. You don't have to renounce one parent to celebrate with the other parent. Families can have history and traditions and foods and in-jokes and heritage. You can join a family by adoption or by marrying in. We're a long way from the era when we would only marry someone from the same shtetl, or only a Maria Litvak and never a Galician, or only a Yiddish speaker and never a Sephardi or Mizrahi Jew, and so on. We're much more open, so maybe this is one more step to a broader open Jewish family. Another interesting shift has been the emphasis on doing Jewish rather than being Jewish. After all, if you don't want to police who's what percent of Jewish from which side in order to 
lift up a Torah scroll or bake a hamantash or spin a dreidel. Maybe instead we think about creating Jewish experiences and welcoming lots of people to experience doing Jewish instead of getting caught up on the being Jewish. You know, we used to think that in Jewish education, the focus should be on inculcating Jewish identity. And once they felt that they were Jewish, that the being Jewish would lead to doing Jewish behaviors, whether it was tzedakah or community involvement or advocacy or joining a congregation. But the reality is that we work better sometimes when we focus on doing Jewish, having Jewish experiences, going to a Purim carnival, spinning a dreidel, uh, baking latkes, etc. Uh, that's why there's much more experiential Judaism that's happening today. Um, and this is part of this new world of Jewish and and rising intermarriage because uh, it's much easier to focus on doing Jewish and it's much more inclusive. After all, even if you want the Jewish partner of a Jewish non-Jewish intermarriage to participate, they might want to know if their partner is welcome to participate with them as a family. This also shifts our dynamics in talking about important Jewish issues. Obviously, the rhetoric on intermarriage can't be this is a Holocaust and a disaster when a large part of your membership of the community has a non-Jewish spouse, or the members of your community have one non-Jewish parent or grandparent. It also changes our conversations about anti-Semitism, and sometimes in unexpected ways. Once my mother was on a cruise and she sat down uh, for dinner at the first evening with the family they were going to be sitting with, the whole cruise, and they're chatting about this and that, and the husband of the couple makes some comment that he was buying something and he got Jewed down on the price. And my mother is about to rise up and you know, yell at him when his wife smacks him on the shoulder and says, you idiot, your son-in-law is Jewish. Now, what I love about this story is that we didn't have to correct him. His family is going to correct him. And she didn't say your son-in-law was Jewish. She said your son-in-law is Jewish. And so most likely the grandkids of this guy will have some kind of Jewish identity. And so the, the anti-Semitism dynamic in that family is going to be very different. He's unlikely to have anti-Semitic grandkids where otherwise he might have. The dynamic of supporting Israel changes as well when you have intercultural families involved in the conversation. Um, and even the process of Holocaust memory. We have a member of my congregation. Uh, he's not Jewish, uh, doesn't identify that way. His background is part uh, Indian and part uh, American Anglo, uh, but he follows the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum on Twitter because he now has a personal interest in the issue. And he shares with me some of the interesting things that they've posted if I happen to miss them. Um, and so remembering the Holocaust, fighting anti-Semitism, advocating for Israel, all those will change as we have more members of our community who are Jewish and, and have connections to people who are not Jewish, but connected or Jewish adjacent. Another interesting change will be the complexities of Jewish pluralism. You see, Jewish pluralism is no longer going to be only or primarily about Jewish practice. Do you keep kosher or not? It's gonna be about whether I accept you as Jewish or not. You know, if you have a Jewish pluralism panel, will you accept a rabbi like Angela Bookdahl on the panel? Or is that beyond your definition of qualifying as Jewish? So the complexities of Jewish pluralism, if they weren't hard enough already, are going to get even more complex. There are going to be new challenges to Jewish education too. I can't go into my Sunday school and say to my kids, what's your favorite holiday after Sukkot? Because a chunk of them will answer Christmas because it's a holiday they celebrate at home. I have to say, what's your favorite Jewish holiday after Sukkot? And then I might get some Torah, I might get Hanukkah, I might get the answer I'm looking for. Um, so the reality is that we have to answer and ask questions differently. Also think about how are you going to talk about intermarriage or about the non-Jewish world when part of your class are children of intermarriage themselves. And finally, Jewish and really can be an opportunity for cultural creativity. Imagine families that might use for their maror for Passover wasabi or kimchi instead of uh, the traditional horseradish or some or, uh, romaine lettuce. You can find other examples of ways to blend, mix the cultures. Think of fusion cuisine, you know, in the foodie world where you have elements of both that come together to make new flavors and new experiences. That's the kind of cultural creativity that's possible when you're open to Jewish and um, in my congregation, for example, that same family, which has somebody checking the Holocaust Memorial Museum Twitter feed, uh, they instituted a tradition of bringing us Hanukkah samosas. They're also fried in oil. 
And so now our congregation looks forward to the Hanukkah samosas every year because that's part of this cultural creativity opportunity that's opened up by the concept of Jewish and. Well, I'm sure there are plenty of questions, comments, reactions. I know this may be outside the comfort zone of some of you, but I want you to know that this is not a normative discussion. I'm not saying what people have to do or must do. I'm trying to explain to you what people are doing, what's already happening out there in the world, and it's the reality that we have to respond to. So I want to end by describing four different people who very well could be Jewish and if we let them. The challenge to the organized Jewish community, when you hear these identities, these biographies, you can think about this. Would you disown and disavow them? Would you make them jump through hoops or into a mikvah? Or would you welcome them as already part of the family? First case is Rachel. Rachel was born in China to Chinese parents. She was adopted by Israeli Jewish parents at age three. She never formally converted to Judaism, but she's fluent in Hebrew. She celebrated a bat mitzvah and she was married under a chuppah. So is Rachel Jewish or Jewish aunt? Second case, Jacob. Jacob was born to a Jewish mother, but given up for adoption. His adoptive father was Mexican American. His adoptive mother was originally from India. The household is totally secular, so they really don't practice any religion. Their holidays are American Memorial Day and American uh, Thanksgiving. He discovers his adoption status and his Jewish heritage at age 25, and he says, eh, okay, I'm Jewish, no big deal. Third case is Sarah. Sarah is born to two Jewish parents. She's raised in a Jewish community. She celebrates a bat mitzvah, and she decides in college that she's an atheist. She wants nothing to do with organized religion or nationalism or separate ethnic identities. She just wants to be human. When she's asked on a survey for her religion, she says, none, I'm not religious. And then the surveyor asks, do you consider yourself Jewish in some other way? And she says, no, or maybe yes, depending on the day. The last case is Sean. Sean is born to a Jewish father and an Irish Catholic mother. He celebrates holidays at home in a cultural way, like Hanukkah and Christmas and Easter and Passover, you know, bunnies and eggs and not the death of Christ. But he never attends a religious institution. He has no formal Jewish education or ceremonies outside of family experiences. In college, he decides to take a birthright Israel trip, and he's told on the trip he has to choose. He can be Jewish or something else, but he can't be both. Now, all of these people could be Jewish and, but you have to think first, in your eyes, are they Jewish at all? And only you can answer that question. On your answer, depends a vibrant Jewish future. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this exploration. I'm sure we have a number of questions or comments. Just to remind you to make sure to put those comments into the chat box so we can uh, respond to them that way. And I will call on Alon now to come back and uh, share with us some of the comments that were offered. Rabbi, thank you so much. What a, a fascinating exploration uh, into the diverse sort of um, way in which we identify ourselves, but also how we engage with people uh, that, that sort of come into our tent. Uh, it really very inspiring, thank you. Um, there's a bunch of questions. Um, there is one from Debbie um, asking uh, whether you believe that embracing a non-Jewish son or daughter-in-law is fundamentally respecting the very principle uh, of, the very Jewish principle of welcoming the stranger. You know, this has always been an interesting challenge for Jews because um, it's easier to deal with the outside world when they don't like us. <laughs> but when they love us <laughs> and they're really nice people and you meet them and the in-laws are nice too, it's, it's a lot harder to reject the concrete person than it is the abstract. Um, there was a study done by the American Jewish Committee in the year 2000 uh, where they asked the lay Jewish population, what do you think about intermarriage? And the results were so shocking, they never asked the questions again. Because they asked questions like, do you think it's racist to oppose intermarriage? And a large number of lay Jews said yes. Do you think we have an obligation to reach out to the non-Jewish partner and to the families? A large number said yes. 
not only emphasizing in marriage and focusing on two Jewish households. So the lay Jewish population is in some ways much further along than the ordinary professional Jewish population and certainly the rabbis. They ask people, should, should rabbis officiate at intermarriage ceremonies? The overwhelming majority of lay Jews said, yes, they should. Most rabbis don't. Uh, even today, when about half of reform rabbis will, large numbers, um, almost all conservative rabbis won't because it's not allowed, and certainly orthodox rabbis, almost all of them will not. Um, so this is one of those cases where the lay people are in a different place than, um, than the rabbis and the leadership. But the reality is that the people have voted. You know, <laughs> they've, they've made their choice. Um, I used to tell a joke that I can't tell anymore because people won't get it. The joke was a man brings home his non-Jewish uh, bride and he says, mother, I want you to meet my, my new wife. Uh, she's a Native American. Her name is Running Deer. And his mother extends her hand gravely and says, I'm sitting Shiva. Now, I can't tell that joke anymore because someone under 35 will say, they know what sitting Shiva is, but why, 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 is, why is he sitting Shiva? That doesn't make any sense to them because the world has shifted in most parts of the, not all, but in most parts of the Jewish world, certainly the liberal Jewish world. Um, so welcoming the stranger, welcoming the in-laws is part of the respect for not only them, but for your child who's chosen someone who loves them. You know, uh, I mean, finding marriage for love is tough enough. <laughs> finding a good marriage that lasts is hard enough. So we don't need to add to it uh, our surahs um, when they found someone who loves them and who's good to them. I think that's something we aspire to. So we celebrate good marriages whoever they are with. Thank you. Um, Ezra asks whether there are any studies or statistics um, on, the, on people who were raised with uh, one Jewish parent, uh, how they would like to raise their own children. Mm. You know, this is a, a really hot topic, um, you know, because the question is, what's the best means to ensure Jewish continuity and having more Jews going forward? You know, we have this paranoia of Jewish demography, even though the Torah says, don't take a census, we keep taking these censuses and counting numbers all the time. Um, so that's a really hot topic. The challenge is it takes a long time to get that number, you know, because you need someone raised with a Jewish parent who then chooses to have a child and then how that child is raised. Um, and we've only experimented with the open society response for the last 15 or 20 years. So if you're talking to someone who's an adult Jew today, their parents were married, let's say, in 1995, okay? Uh, because say they're 25 now, let's say they had a kid within the first year, which is unusual. They, their parents might've been married in 1980 or 19, uh, 1985 or 1990. What were the odds they had a rabbi officiate at the wedding? What were the odds they found a community that would accept them as members? Much lower than they are today. So I just think that the environment is so different today where a person with one Jewish parent could find a rabbi to marry them, could find a congregation willing to accept their children and their spouse as members and participants. Um, their family is much more accepting than they were a generation ago. So we're gonna find very different answers coming out. That's why I wanna see the 2020 study because that will show some of that uh, echoing impact. And even in local areas in Boston and San Francisco where they've done more work reaching out to intermarried couples and the children of intermarriage, they've seen improved results in terms of choosing to raise their kids at least somewhat Jewish. Um, so it's a moving target. Um, I think that, uh, look, the, the plain reality is that when you have someone of a mixed heritage background, the odds are higher they're going to make a non-Jewish choice. We even saw that in those numbers I highlighted where 36% or so were still making a non-Jewish choice for their kids um, compared to the 57% a generation earlier. Um, so that's still more likely to happen in that case. Again, it's their family's choice of how they choose to connect with their heritage. But I think we as the Jewish community can improve the odds by the way we respond. If our response is oy vey, that's gonna get one result. If our response is mazel tov, that's going to get a different result. Uh, Mandy uh, writes from Melbourne, uh, asking whether you've ever counseled uh, Orthodox families uh, where their child has chosen to marry someone who is not Jewish um, and how, have, or how do you sort of understand or, or deal with the grief that is real for their, you know, in their lives? Sure. Well, in some sense, the, the marrying out, if you want to use that language, is, a, is in some ways an echo of a different challenge, which is their child has chosen a different lifestyle. 
I actually had a conversation, believe it or not, with a Catholic mother of a couple who I was marrying uh, because she was so upset that her son wasn't Catholic anymore. Uh, and that he was then choosing to marry a, a largely cultural Jew, um, and he himself was not religious. He fit into that, that demographic study perfectly. Um, but she was upset. See, the, the problem with her wasn't that he was marrying someone Jewish. It was that he was not following her religious tradition anymore. And so my guess is that in Orthodox Jewish families, which is not my specialty of counseling, they, they wouldn't come to me or recognize me as a rabbi, frankly, in most cases, um, the, the choice of marrying a non-Jewish partner is part of the choice of not choosing to live the same lifestyle of Orthodox practice and observance of their parents. I don't know, I'm sure they exist, but I don't know of Orthodox individuals who've married non-Jewish partners. Now, there are people who are religiously Jewish in some way who do have non-Jewish partners, even uh, Reform Jewish renewal rabbis who have married non-Jewish partners. In some cases, they marry other clergy because they have some things in common. Um, so that definitely has happened. Um, in fact, there's an ongoing debate now in the reform movement, and there was recently in the Reconstructionist movement, about allowing rabbinical students in who are dating non-Jewish people uh, to participate in, the, uh, in their program. So there are ways to be religiously Jewish and intermarried, um, but maybe part of the, uh, the Orthodox uh, pain involved is not just the non-Jewish spouse, but the fact that they're leaving Orthodoxy, and it's sort of tied up one with the other. Um, and the other thing I would uh, encourage them to think about is, again, focus on the positive. Is this a good person? Is this person good for your child? Will they explore Jewish options for their family in the future? Will they celebrate Hanukkah at home? Will they come to your family for Passover? Well, you know, you have to have that door open because the closed door is going to get the negative result but the open door gives you an opportunity for a positive result. Our final question for this morning before we have to end uh, is from Benji Sharp, who asks whether um, you think that there's a difference or should be a difference between uh, the acceptance by and of religious communities versus uh, communal bodies that are, if, you know, do not have religion in, in, as their center. Excellent question. Um, I mean, one could also add the, the issue of acceptance by uh, the, the Jewish state of Israel versus specific religious bodies within that state. Um, at one time, actually, if you read the history of this in the 1950s, uh, members of the Labor Party who were in charge of the Interior Ministry um, actually proposed allowing a self-definition process. Anybody who chooses to identify as Jewish, let them register that way by the state. If they want to marry Orthodox, they can deal with that problem on their own. But the state might accept them by a self-declaration of being Jewish. An interesting, you know, road not taken in that option. But in terms of the Jewish communal organizations, I don't think it's their job to make that definition. I had this discussion with a funeral uh, home once uh, because I had a, a couple I was working with. The man had advanced cancer. He was Jewish. His wife was not. Wonderful young couple. Um, but he was very concerned about choosing a burial plot where she could be buried next to him if that's what she chose to do. Uh, these are people in the 30s, you know, this is really tragic. Um, and so I talked to the funeral director and I said, what's the deal here? You know, uh, how strict are these cemeteries in terms of deciding who's allowed to be buried next to whom? Um, and the answer he gave me was, we rely on the rabbis to make that determination. So if I had written her a letter saying she has thrown her lot with the Jewish people or some version of that, then most likely they would have allowed her to be buried there because it's not their job to be the Jewish police. And I would say that's the same for if there's Jewish community schools that are not movement identified, if there are Jewish social service agencies, uh, if there are Jewish cultural events, I would keep as wide a tent as possible to let people in, you know, to be part of the family. I'm, I'm a big family reunion kind of person. Um, but when it comes to deciding who's invited to your wedding, you don't have to invite your third cousin twice removed if you don't want to. You know, individual religious communities can make their own determinations for who qualifies by their standards. Um, and I know that, you know, I, I would qualify as Jewish because I'm Jewish on both sides as far back as we can find. Um, they might not like what I do in terms of Judaism, but that's a different conversation. And I know that other people who are part of my community and very welcome and active and fully welcomed as Jewish, might not be welcome in other contexts. And I think they know that too. Um, and so they choose not to live their life by that community standards, they live by their own. If each community lives by its own standards, it's wonderful. But as a shared Jewish community, 
I think we should be as welcoming as possible. Raleigh, well, thank you so much. Uh, that was a fantastic presentation and really thank you for answering all of those questions. Um, I, I, I think that this project, this Limud project, uh, really uh, embodies what you've been speaking about in creating a big, broad tent Judaism that welcomes all ideas and people into the community uh, and allows us uh, to take that step further on our Jewish journey. Um, I thank everyone. I'm sorry that I couldn't answer all the questions um, or ask all the questions, sorry. Um, thank you to you, Rabbi, if everyone give you a round of applause uh, and uh, head off to your next sessions. Thank you. I'll also uh, put up on the screen my Twitter handle and email address. If anyone wants to be in touch separately, I'm happy to uh, continue the conversation that way. Amazing. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for joining us.